Hello everyone and welcome to QuantPy. It's high time we tackle the HJM framework and let me quickly explain what we are going to cover in this video. We know that the HJM models the dynamics up in instantaneous forward that references a fixed maturity time. There's a continuum of such forwards but you can develop the whole framework by focusing on just one generic maturity, say capital T. Like many stochastic differential equations that you see in finance, it has got a drift term and a volatility term. The drift term has to satisfy certain conditions to avoid arbitrage, so we are going to derive those conditions, first under the risk neutral measure and then under the forward measure. These conditions are the crux of the HJM framework and once you understand the drift conditions, then the rest follow quite naturally. We will then discuss the volatility term and we shall see that the volatility practically dictates what kind of stochastic process does the instantaneous forward take. We will then discuss a few simplifications of the volatility that makes the model more tractable from theoretical and implementation perspective, by which I mean Gaussian and Markovian really. By the way, we are assuming that the randomness is coming from just one Brownian, and practice you will use a few, but once you understand the framework using one Brownian, then extension to multiple Brownians is a relatively straightforward. The volatility could be a function of the instantaneous forward as well, but I'm not going to write it explicitly to avoid clutter. Whilst the volatility could be a function of the instantaneous forward, the geometric Brownian type specification won't work for some technical reasons, and towards the end of the video, I'm going to explain how those technical conditions come about. Right, so let's start with the dynamics under the risk neutral measure. If we know the volatility of an asset process, then we can easily write its dynamics under the risk neutral measure because we know the expected return under the risk neutral measure must be equal to the risk free rate. But the problem that we have is the instantaneous forward is not a traded asset. Not a big problem though because the zero coupon of the same maturity is a traded asset so we can write its dynamics under the risk neutral measure, where r is the same r that we used in the definition of the bank account, sigma p is the volatility of the zero coupon, which is different from sigma f, and we shall see very shortly how these two are linked. So now we need to find a way to infer the dynamics of the instantaneous forward from the dynamics of the zero coupon. We saw in the previous video that we can write the instantaneous forward as a function of the zero coupon. We are interested in the differential, so let's apply differential to both sides, where we assume that uh, we can interchange the derivative and the differential. This is going to be legit for the cases that we are considering here, so this assumption is going to be harmless for now. We are going to use this relationship to derive the dynamics of the instantaneous forward from the dynamics of the zero coupon. So we need to determine the differential of log of p for which we will need the Ito's lemma which says that the differential of a function of a random process is equal to the first derivative times the differential plus half the second derivative times the quadratic term. We have derived this formula under the stochastic calculus playlist so if you would like a refresher then please do watch this video. For log of x the first derivative is 1 over x and the second derivative is minus 1 over x squared. So this becomes. Now let's substitute the price of the zero coupon for x. Now we need to determine the two terms on the right hand side. The first one is easy. We will just shift p to the left hand side. And for the quadratic term, we know delta t square and the cross term between delta t and delta w will become 0 and delta w square will become dt so we get sigma square delta t. We can substitute these into the differential of the log of p now. Now we need to take the derivative of this with respect to the capital T where I just use the fact that the derivative of sigma square is equal to 2 sigma so the 2's cancel. Now the differential of the forward is equal to the negative of this. So we will change the signs of the two terms and rearrange. And now we have the dynamics of the instantaneous forward under the risk neutral measure. 
Now both the differentials are representing the dynamics of the same instantaneous forward, so it means the volatility terms must be equal and the drift terms must be equal. We can solve the equation on the left hand side for sigma p. We just have to integrate where c is the integration constant. Now we know that the zero coupon pays one quid at maturity with zero volatility. So the volatility at maturity is zero, which means c is zero. So now we have sigma p. The minus sign is down to the fact that the prices of the zero coupon and the instantaneous forward are inversely related. And the integral is down to the fact that the zero coupon spends the whole range of a forwards over its remaining maturity. Now we can substitute sigma p and the derivative of sigma p from the left hand side and to the drift term. And now we have the full dynamics of the instantaneous forward under the risk neutral measure. So everything is down to the volatility then. And to build the term structure, what you need to do is to get the initial forward and specify the volatility and the HJM will take care of the rest. Right, so now that we have the dynamics under the risk neutral majam, let's see if we can translate these into the dynamics under the forward majam. By the way, the probability major manifests itself through the Brownian, so this W here will have the properties of the Brownian under the risk neutral major. And when you change the probability major, then you're reweighting the probabilities. So process this Brownian under the new probability major will be a different process. And the main game now is to establish the connection between the two. And once we have done that, then we can substitute the new Brownian for the old and call it dynamics under the forward measure. Now this is a classic learning exercise for a wonder technique called the change of numeraire approach. So this is the approach we are going to use. We know there is neutral valuation approach. If you express the value of any asset in the units of the bank account, then this process is a martingale under the risk neutral measure. This approach is quite general, so instead of using the bank account as the numeraire, you can use another asset, say the price of a zero coupon as the numeraire. Then the value of any asset expressed in the units of the zero coupon will be martingale, but under a different probability measure. So each numeraire in a way induces a probability measure, and the Measure induced by using the capital T maturity zero coupon is called the T forward measure. Now we can shift the P and the denominator of the first equation to the right hand side, and because it's known, we can take it inside the expectation. We can do the same thing with the equation on the right hand side. You would write the expectation of a variable as the integral of the variable with respect to the probability measure. So we get delta Q on the left hand side and delta P on the right hand side. Now both equations are representing the price of the same asset. So the right hand side must be equal. And because this relationship must hold for any asset, it means the following must be true. Which we can rearrange to get the derivative of the new probability measure with respect to the old one. Now we need to determine the ratio of the bank account and the ratio of the zero coupon. We were halfway through to the derivation of the first when we applied the Eto's lemma to the log of p. So let's reproduce the results. We can integrate and then just exponentiate to get the ratio of the prices of the zero coupon at two different times. We know the value of the bank account from the previous video and we can rearrange this to get the ratio of B0 and Bt. Now if we substitute this expression into the derivative, the integrals of R cancel and we are left with an expression that smells like the radon nicodem derivative. We discussed the radon nicodem derivative in the change of probability measure video. So let's reproduce the main result of that video, which is the Gersonov theorem. We called it the Cameron Martin Gersonov theorem. So if W is a Brownian motion under a probability measure Q, and you introduce a new process, then the Brownian motion adjusted by this process is a Brownian motion, but under a different probability measure, which is defined by the Radon Nicodem derivative. 
You can see the y in the exponent of the radon nicodem is linked to the y in the adjustment to the Brownian. You can also write the relationship between the two Brownians in differential form. Now if you compare the radon nicodem and the Gerasonov theorem with the derivative that we have, then we see that the y is equal to sigma p. So we can write the relationship between the Brownian motion under the forward measure and the Brownian motion under the Ries Newton measure. So we will just need to subtract this sigma p. We saw earlier that the sigma p is just the integral of sigma f. So we can make this substitution. And now we can reproduce the dynamics under the Ries Newton measure and substitute for the old Brownian. Now the two integrals cancel each other and we are left with the stochastic term, meaning the instantaneous forward is a martingale under the forward measure. This is quite handy now, so if you were to model an instantaneous forward of maturity capital T using the zero coupon of the same maturity as the numera, then you will get the martingale, which means that you can apply the machinery of martingale theory straight away. But in reality, you'll be mostly tasked with the modeling multiple forwards at the same time, say T1 all the way to some terminal maturities, let's call it TF. And the last thing you would want to do is to model each one of them under a different probability measure. So normally you would see that people would select the longest maturity zero coupon as the numera. And an obvious advantage of using the longest maturity zero coupon is that your numera asset will be alive or meaningful for the whole length of your analysis period, which is good because you know that the zero coupon becomes meaningless after its maturity. Right, so now let's see what dynamics do we get for an instantaneous forward of maturity capital T, which is smaller than TF. So we can write the valuation formally under the risk Newton measure and under the TF forward measure. If we compare the right hand sides of the two equations, we get the radon nicotin derivative, which is very similar to the results we got earlier. The only change is that we have TF in place of capital T, which you would expect because we are using the longer maturity zero coupon as the numerator now. So the Brownian under the terminal forward will be linked to the Brownian under the risk neutral, again via the sigma p, but now it's the volatility of a longer maturity zero coupon. So the integral will now run from T to TF. Now let's reproduce the dynamics under the risk newton measure. And let's substitute for the old Brownian. Now we can split the last integral into two intervals and we are left with the residual. So the drift term will now have the integral running from capital T, which is the maturity of the forward that we are modeling, and TF, which is the maturity of the longer maturity zero coupon that we are using as the numerator. So in a nutshell then, when we model the dynamics of the T maturity forward under the risk neutral measure, the drift will have the integral with the remaining maturity of the zero coupon. When we model the dynamics under the T forward measure, the drift will be zero. And when we model the dynamics under a longer maturity zero coupon, then the drift will have the integral running from the maturity of the forward that we are modeling and the maturity of the zero coupon that we are using as the numerator. So whatever probability measure you work with, volatility is the king because it pretty much drives the dynamics of the instantaneous forward. Given the importance of the volatility, let's discuss how the volatility drives the dynamics of the instantaneous forward. Let's reproduce the HJM dynamics under the risk neutral measure. Let's integrate to see how the solution looks like. We said that the volatility could be a function of the instantaneous forward. So in general, the HJM will give you the dynamics of the instantaneous forward that are non-Markovian. There's nothing wrong with the non-Markovian processes, but their implementation is hard. So let's discuss a couple of simplifications. For the first one, let's assume that the volatility is a deterministic function of time and maturity only. Then we know from the properties of the Eto integral that the instantaneous forward will be Gaussian. Roughly, you can see that the 
Brownian increments are normally distributed, so you can interpret the last term as a linear combination of normals with deterministic weights. The first term is deterministic, so the whole expression is like a linear transformation of a combination of normals, so the result must be normal. And Gaussian process is really the equivalent of normal when you switch from random variable to random process. Now let's see how can we make this a Markov process. So remember from the introduction to the stochastic processes video, a process is Markov if the distribution of the future values depends only on the current value of the process and not the history. So knowing the current value is as good as knowing the entire history of the process. And you can see that it would be quite handy because you won't need to keep track of the entire history of the process when you're modeling it. The first term is deterministic, so it's not going to dictate whether the process is Markovian, so everything is going to be down to the stochastic term. So let's focus on the stochastic term and consider its increments from small t to capital T. Now we need to check whether the expected value of these increments require the past knowledge of the process or does the information that we have at small t suffice. Let's split the first integral into two so that one of the intervals gets aligned to the integral on the right hand side and then we can combine the two integrals with the smaller interval. You know the expected value of the first term is zero because it is an integral of a deterministic function with respect to the Brownian. The second term is not zero though because its value is fixed by small t so the Brownian values that we have here would already have been realized. What it means is the process is not Markov. If we assume that the process is separable, in the sense that we can write it uh, as a product of the function of time and maturity, then we can show that the process is Markov. We can make the substitution in the stochastic term and into the increments, and we can take the h out of the integral because uh, it doesn't depend on the integrating variable. Now the expected value of the first term will be zero because it is the integral of a deterministic function with respect to the Brownian. For the second term, if you divide and multiply by h, then you get dt. So now the expected value of the increment of the process from small t to capital T only requires the value of the process at small t, which means that this is now a Markov process. And now for the icing on the cake, let's see why the log normal type uh, specification won't work. So let's reproduce the HJM dynamics under the recent Newton measure. And let's assume that the volatility is equal to sigma times f. This is how you would write the volatility term of the log normal process, right? We can substitute the volatility. And we can take the volatility in f out of the integral because they don't depend on the integrating variable. Now we can evaluate the integral which is uh, just replacing the integral with the length of the interval really. And now let's focus on the deterministic component. We can solve this equation through the separation of variables approach. So essentially you separate each variable on one side and then integrate. The left hand side is like the derivative of minus 1 over x and the right hand side is more like uh, the derivative of x square. Now we can evaluate the expression at the upper and lower integration limits. And we can separate 1 over f on the left hand side. And we can combine the terms on the right hand side. And now we can invert this to get the ft. Now the denominator has got 1 minus something, which means at some point it can become 0. And if the denominator becomes 0, it means the instantaneous forward will become infinity which means the price of the zero coupon will be zero. So you can get a zero coupon, which pays one quid at maturity for zero, meaning there's arbitrage. That's the reason that the log normal type specifications won't work, but this is only a problem for the continuous settings. And once you move to the discrete settings like the LIBOR market model, then this is no longer an issue. Right, so I think we covered all the topics that we had on the list. So I hope you enjoyed this video and I look forward to seeing you in the next when we use this framework to derive the short rate models of Holy and the Hull-White extended Wozniak model. 
and we will leave the CIR as an exercise.